Hi, everybody. If you can just let me know that you can hear me fine, that would be great, a couple of you. I am your 2017-2018 instruction section chair, and you are joining us today for the ALA instruction section 2018 annual program. This is the first time that we have done this online. Um, today our topic is curriculum mapping from planning to practice and I'm really glad that you've joined us. It looks like we have almost 200 people logged in so that's a great um, attendance and we will be recording this session so you can watch this later, share it with your colleagues, whatever works for you down the road. Um, I have a few notes for us before we get started. Um, as you may recall, the instruction section went virtual for Midwinter Conference in 2010, and we went entirely virtual this year. This means that there are no longer any committee meetings, there are no programs organized by the instruction section at the annual conference. Um, we made this decision with feedback from the membership. A majority of you told us in recent years that there was less positive impact on your professional development uh, from attending ALA in person. And I think uh, one of the um, one of the things that I heard most often was that you wanted to use your money for other things. You wanted to attend conferences like LOEX, um, very practical. So that's uh, what the way how we're moving forward. So when I started um, in the instruction section, I can remember in the mid aughts, the annual program would have over 500 people in the room. It would be standing room only. And in the past year, few years, there really hasn't been um, very much close to even 100. So I think you can see the virtual with twice that is really good numbers. Um, Another note for you is that I charged a new task force this year called the Building Virtual Community Task Force. It's being chaired by Joe Getz and Liz Barksdale, and they're working with the executive committee, um, the membership, and an emerging leaders group to come up with new ideas for how the section can work together in a virtual environment. Uh, we have, you might have participated in one of the two focus groups that were held online in the last week. Um, the task force is gathering some great ideas and I think that you'll see some changes to the section in the coming year that will be really productive for all of us. So when I think about uh, what IS means to me personally and um, the things that I've benefited from the most in addition to the professional development. It's really been the community building, getting to know my colleagues from around the country so that I could send an email or call somebody and say, what do you know about curriculum mapping, for example? Um, so that's one of the things we wanna to try to build into the virtual environment. And one of the ideas we talked about this week was um, holding Google Hangouts brown bag lunches informally throughout the semester so that folks could talk in small groups and see each other face to face and talk about work stuff, but also informal things too. So we really want to try to build a new community around IS. So if you have ideas, please share them. There is a link on the main uh, IS website right on the front page, a feedback form. Please take a few minutes to fill it out to affirm uh, what we're doing or if you have new ideas, that would be great. And watch the ILI list for new announcements over the summer. So back to our time together today. Um, the program is going to be online for the foreseeable future. Um, this session today is in parallel to a session that was arranged by the Management and Leadership Committee on April 25th. That session was recorded, so you can watch that anytime. One of the things that we've always done in our annual program is celebrate the awards. We have three awards in the instruction section, the Innovation Award, the Eileen F. Rockman Publication uh, of the Year Award, the Miriam Dudley Instruction Librarian Award, and I would like to take a moment to congratulate all of our winners for this year. Um, for the Innovation Award, we have the 23 Framework Things that Trent Bragg uh, Bragram and Amy Mars and Kim Pittman um, arranged for us and I believe all of that's still online so you can use that anytime if you're working with the framework. 
Um, Jennifer Newtfall is our Rockman Publication of the Year Award winner for Service Learning, Information Literacy in Libraries. And I haven't had a chance to read that book, but it's on my list. I'm gonna purchase that, Jennifer, and put it on my bookshelf. And the Dudley Award winner this year is the amazing Sharon Mater. She uh, most recently worked for ACRL on implementing the ACRL framework, did a great job at that, and is now, I believe, officially retired and doing some library things um, in the background. And I know she's here with us today. Hi, Sharon. Um, so the award winners were announced in CRL News, so you can read the details about those awards um, this spring in CRL News, and we also are planning uh, interviews of those award winners so you can get to know the award winners a little bit better, but most importantly, we will celebrate them in person at the ACRL National Conference. So next year in Cleveland, Ohio, we will celebrate this year's award winners as well as next year's award winners. And that's how we'll move forward every two years in person and then do some virtual celebrations as well in the off years. Okay, so let's move on to today's program. I would like to thank our panelists for being here with us today and sharing their expertise. We have, uh, and I'm sorry if I pronounce names wrong, Elizabeth Chabot, uh, Susan Gardner Archambault, Laura Koo, Casey Lundstrom, um, and Sora Morris Whitver. And we are really excited to go through uh, curriculum mapping, the history of curriculum mapping, um, as well as looking at some programmatic approaches and case studies. So the way we'll handle this today is the panelists will go through their slides. They each have about 10 minutes to talk. If you have questions, please put those in the chat box. I will gather those during our time together and we'll pull them together at the end for the panelists. So thank you for being with us here today. And I'm gonna pass the mic over to Susan. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Maybe just if someone could type type in the box. All right, great. Um, so uh, next slide. So curriculum mapping was developed in the 1970s for primary and secondary teachers. The original Latin meaning of the word curriculum is loosely translated to mean the course, the path, the road. Curriculum mapping was a way for K through 12 teachers to inventory the major concepts taught in their classrooms and the time span allotted for each major concept on the academic calendar. Uh, next slide. Michael Eisenberg noted that curriculum defines what is taught in what order with what methods and materials and how it is evaluated. Mapping allowed for the recording of overlap and variance among teachers teaching similar content so that the structure of a program became more visible. It replaced the old top-down prescriptive approach where teachers were encouraged to align their class time to the official district curriculum. Traditional procedures for curriculum development were still supervised by a teacher, evaluator or coordinator and almost all the maps went through a third party. Next slide. In 1984, Michael Eisenberg described a curriculum mapping project done for the New York State Bureau to school libraries to identify the units in the curriculum that were most suited for library media center involvement. The mapping was done using a computer-based system called CMAP to allow for data manipulation and also the level of instruction, specifically whether it was being introduced, reinforced, or expanded upon, was recorded for each learning objective. Next slide. Here's a screenshot of the curriculum mapping worksheet that was used. You can see that they also recorded the teaching method the materials used, the organization of instruction, and also how it was evaluated. Next slide. 
Heidi Hayes Jacobs is considered an authority in K through 12 curriculum development. She greatly expanded on the concept of curriculum mapping in the late 80s and early 90s by pushing for greater teacher participation in the development process and getting rid of the third party. She believed that the teacher was the designer of the classroom and that her or his curriculum should be integrated into the learning objectives and purpose of the school rather than the other way around. Heidi listed four phases in the curriculum mapping process. Number one was laying the foundation to develop a deeper understanding of curriculum mapping and your school's reason for mapping. Number two was launching the process and organizing the structure and orchestrating the mapping. Number three was maintaining, sustaining, and integrating the system. This included assessment data and literacy skills. And then number four was advanced mapping tasks for the future. Her best practice recommendations are still relevant to current day mappers. Ironically, her description of primary and secondary education in the late 90s applies to universities in the current day. Though teachers may work together in the same building for years, they usually have sketchy knowledge of what goes on in each other's classrooms. Next slide. Pictured here is the Mapster online curriculum mapping software that was created by the Greater Southern Tier Board of Cooperative Educational Services. Mapster's curriculum maps are for entire school districts, and they're based on the model created by Heidi Hayes Jacobs. The maps have the date that they were last updated, as well as a place to record essential questions, content, skills, assessment, and standards. The maps are searchable by keyword, grade level, and author. They can be filtered to just your building, just your school district, or you can search across all the maps. You can compare multiple maps against each other. This is just one of many examples of the early K through 12 curriculum mapping software. Next slide. <clears throat> Academic librarians began taking a closer look at syllabus analysis as a useful research method for determining course assignments in order to match these up with corresponding library usage. This was really the precursor to curriculum mapping in our field. Next slide. Late, uh, early studies include Linda Rambler in 1982. Uh, she used a syllabus study to determine categories of library usage. And then Jeremy Sales in 1985 used a syllabus study to observe gaps in collection development. He also proposed evaluating courses using the Library of Congress subject headings. And then other early studies looked at the types of assignments given and how this could help anticipate research help requests. Next slide. Later studies shifted the focus from a content view to a competency view, looking at things like the required research and information literacy skills that were required in assignments, as well as the intersections with other wider learning outcomes, including not just departmental, but institutional, regional, national, or even the professional standards of accrediting bodies. Several studies looked at the ACRL Information Literacy Competency Standards. These later studies asked where library instruction occurs within the curriculum and urged libraries to develop library-specific learning outcomes of their own. Next slide. Bullard and Holden in 2008 presented on curriculum mapping in a science setting, and they outlined these four steps for curriculum mapping a discipline. Number one is to review the degree requirements for your course of study. Number two is to analyze individual courses and identify existing information literacy concepts and areas of weakness. 
Number three, draft, create a draft of a curriculum map showing areas of existing and potential information literacy. And number four, uh, request a meeting with faculty with whom you have good relationships already, um, share your results with them, and then market it to the rest of the department. Next slide. Here is a mapping worksheet from Oxford College of Emory University, where they pared down the ACRL information literacy competency standards into a list of prioritized goals for student learning. This was compatible with the WEAVE online assessment management system. Next slide. The Claremont College's library in 2012 took a visualization based approach to curriculum mapping by using the Mindomo software to do concept mapping to depict the path and requirements of a major and identify how their efforts could be directed or maybe even redirected. Next slide. So I touched really briefly on some of the key studies in curriculum mapping, but of course there are many more out there. If you want to read more information on the history of curriculum mapping, take a look at this article published by me and my colleague Jennifer Masanaga in the Journal of Library Administration. We began looking into the history of curriculum mapping in order to use the procedure here at LMU to integrate information literacy into our core curriculum. So now I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. Hi, just another um, sound check. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. If that changes, let me know. I'll keep my eye on it. So my name is Casey Lundstrom. I'm from Utah State University Libraries. And today I'm going to talk about curriculum mapping as a tool for strategic instruction and sustainable programs um, as sort of a case study perspective on, on what we've done. Next slide, please. So um, our origin story, it started about seven years ago. Uh, Wendy Holiday was our coordinator of library instruction. And she kind of recognized a need for moving from um, working with people that we knew, whether that was from yoga or whatever it was to working with people in a, in a strategic way and noting the classes that we were in and managing all that differently. Um, so since then, um, we have mapped nearly all undergraduate programs and some grad. Um, the software that we use is the one um, that was just shown to you, the Mindomo visual, visualization. Um, and of course, there are other ways of mapping, um, like the greater ma uh, matrices, and those can complement this really big picture view as well. We mostly use them internally in terms of the strategic decision making happening. Um, and then we have shared it in multiple ways with faculty. We often revise the, the visualization and kind of simplify it for faculty, because as I show you in a moment, it is somewhat unwieldy, um, but also helpful. So um, we'll talk about that more. Uh, next. So over the years, we have made some revisions. There are quite a few decisions to make with curriculum mapping, depending on how we do it. Um, and we've gained some new, it's called Mindomo, M-I-N-D-O-M-O. -O. Um, we've gained some new data points um, over the years. And one thing that we finally sort of gotten together is our data input workflow and schedule. So we decided on six data points updated in the map annually. And it used to be that the maps were kind of updated randomly, often instigated by a subject li librarian review. So each subject librarian in each area would go into their map and revise it. Um, but um, things got busy and um, people have mixed feelings, um, mixed comfort levels with the software. Um, so we decided to just have that happen centrally. So our teaching assistant updates all of the, those data points um, each, each October. We also made decisions about removing old data. So since we've been doing this for a while, um, we just had too much data. And so for each data point, we decided what the cutoff point was and got rid of the old stuff. We archived it, but it's not in the maps anymore. Um, we also created a key. So one of the helpful things is a very big picture view and different icons and colors help differentiate different meanings and potential um, targets. So a key is really helpful in sharing that widely. 
And there is some training. Uh, usually I meet with subject librarians to help sort of um, work, look at it together. So that kind of cuts down on the training or, um, or what people need to know. Um, but we also do things like work days as a group of subject librarians where we help each other um, look at the maps together. Uh, next. Okay, so I'll kind of slow down here. This is um, a section of a Mindomo map. Um, I'm gonna talk about it in terms of this LED 3000 red highlighted class. Not all courses have all these things happening. I purposely took a class that had the six data points. So um, I'll just kind of start on the left here with the blue computer. Um, that re represents online modules that we integrate with in our learning management system canvas. Um, they pull the data for us and then we put it in the map. So one thing that we've struggled with over the years is we have all this stuff happening behind the scenes in online tutorials. How can we know where and how that's happening? So this helps us put it in perspective with the larger picture. The second piece is the red highlight um, and the CI designation in the center. Is, it's a general education designation um, and it means it's communications intensive. So as a possible target, uh, it means lots of writing and, um, and speaking is happening. And so those can be, um, we work with a lot of CI courses. This happens to be a course we already work with. Um, and it's, uh, it designates face-to-face -face sessions. And it's, uh, the, the notes next to it designate um, the outcomes that have been articulated for it, uh, which instructors are teaching, um, and any other notes that you might want to, and which semesters it happened. Just below that is the high impact class. And I think I'll probably um, try to get through the content and then answer as many questions as I can after. Um, so I, I don't want anyone to feel ignored, but I'm happy to talk more about this um, later too. I'll put my email on the board shortly. So the yellow highlight means that um, it's analytics that came from our institution. And basically they sent me 14 classes that were high impact in terms of rigor and sort of success over time in terms of retention to the next semester. So that is a somewhat unique data point to us, but I imagine there are like um, similar data points available to other institutions. And that's one that's helpful because those are, um, those are blinking lights as, in terms of targets we should definitely focus on. Uh, the last one is that green book is another targeting feature. So that means that the evaluation system that we use for student feedback, faculty are required to um, choose outcomes. Research outcome number nine is the one we keep our eye on. So that blue book means that class and that instructor chose research outcome nine. So that is a place that we investigate. Uh, next. So what else can we learn um, other than sort of the icons we just talked about as potential targets? Uh, you can learn where to be. So um, in this case, um, the discipline is Rangeland Resources, which is a program within wildland departments. Um, its sort of sister department is Watershed. And the course that's circled is a Watershed course. And these are courses that we get a lot of bang for our buck because this course is um, happening across the watershed program and also across um, the wildland program. So when an overworked subject librarian approaches me and says, where should I put my time, uh, especially when we don't have a lot of instruction hold in this particular department and we suspect there are needs there that we haven't tapped into, this is a good way to sort of focus that. So the outcomes, I'm breaking my rule, but the outcomes come from um, program, it, it sort of depends. So most instructors work to write the outcomes um, along with the instructors that they work with. And then we also look at program and discipline out outcomes. And some are better articulated across, um, across departments than others. And we've had conversations and presentations with faculty about that as well. So um, uh, next, please. So one of my favorite um, ways to use mapping is as a tool to help with sustainability. And I've heard complaints or perceptions that librarians are trying to be in all the classes all the time. And I've heard the same of the goals of, cur of curriculum mapping. And I actually see it as the opposite. And maybe that's that I haven't been marketing as well to um, our, our librarians, but um, 
it can really be a tool to strategically align and extract from places. And I think this is, um, this is becoming an issue for a lot of institutions. We, we have gotten into a lot of classes and they're not all necessarily the most strategic and we have to find ways to extract ourselves. Uh, so what we are lucky in that we have hired an online librarian. So we don't so, so much say no as we do say we're shifting to online if they're willing to do it. So this is an example of the English department, the Lit History program, and we are in three of those courses, but students are choosing two of them out of six so, and this is just a small piece of the larger English department, and there's lots of information literacy, face-to-face -face sessions and online modules happening. So really, these courses are not as strategic as they could be. Um, and so we are currently in the progress of moving them, rethinking how we integrate with them and shifting them online. So that's an example of where um, we're getting out. Uh, next. So as we move towards sustainability, we obviously are focusing on things that are high impact required and scalable, scalable, and we're using the data points that we have that we think correlate with those things. We're also trying to map varied instructional modes. So our online learning materials, our face-to-face -face sessions, and our workshops. Uh, next. Uh, there are some additional benefits to things I've already talked about. One is an easy handoff as people leave the institution or as subject areas change hands, which ha happens quite often for us. Uh, another is that it places data together in a meaningful way. So I notice things with this view that I don't see when I'm just combing through a course catalog. And it forces us to think big picture. And from a programmatic coordinator viewpoint, it really forces me to do that and to think hard about putting resources where they will have the most impact. Uh, next. So I think the challenges are worth noting, and um, I'm trying to be honest and just full confession, I'm not always certain of how, if I'm meeting the challenges in the best way, but here are some things um, that, that we're working with. One is that curriculums are constantly in flux. So I think of curriculums as these giant breathing organisms that are constantly shifting. It helps that I sit on the Educational Policy Committee and the General Education Committee, and we have a librarian on the Curriculum Committee. So that gives us kind of a hand in all of it to see what's shifting, but it's still a pretty massive endeavor. There is also some resistance and discomfort with mapping, um, and this will maybe get at some of the questions. Um, in terms of um, how our program works, we have a subject librarian model that requires um, people across the library to be subject librarians, um, faculty, their faculty and their subject librarians, and many of them also have other major roles. So um, one of the major things we're, we're um, grappling with is revising our subject librarian model. And one of the central questions is, who will do the instruction work and what are the expectations for that work? And I do feel like um, the curricular um, aspect of instruction work is falling to the periphery of what subject librarians might be asked to do with instruction. So um, that leads to the next slide. Um, sorry, that robot represents the future. <laughs> um, there are quite a few things um, that I'm thinking about. And one, I don't necessarily think committees solve all problems, but I do think in this case, it might be useful. Um, so getting a broad representation of people who do instruction across our library and having that small group of people help drive the curriculum mapping. Uh, of course, this intersects with issues of workload, um, workflow, and buy-in from the subject librarians um, that we would be guiding, but I think that might be a good option for us. I'd also like to see broader use and more reflection on the curriculum in general. What other services might we map to to give us a more holistic picture of what we do and who it reaches? Um, how might collections play a role in here? Our digital initiatives, outreach? I feel like we could be um, using these in more rich ways. Uh, and the last thing that becomes clear in looking at maps and discussing instructional opportunities is other factors that play a role. And assignments is one of those major factors. We have a few departments that are in real need of curricular alignment, but the assignments they're using is um, definitely a part of that um, issue. And revised assignments would help. And we have been offering semesterly charrettes or assignment design workshops with faculty. And those have given us another point in which to intersect with the curriculum. So while it doesn't always lead to more library instruction, which isn't our goal necessarily, it gives us an opportunity to shape research assignments that lead to better learning opportunities for students. 
So we haven't added those interactions to the maps yet, but it's something I'm thinking about. Uh, next, those are my images, robot and all. And um, next, uh, I know it was a short and fast um, presentation, so I am happy to talk anytime to anyone. Um, and yes, I did create that um, um, bit emoji just for this presentation, so thanks. All right, once again, can everybody hear me? Everybody's good. Uh, hi, friends. I'm Sarah Marie Switfer. I'm the coordinator of library instruction at the University of Alabama Libraries. Um, so curriculum mapping was a major project that facilitated a cultural change in our liaison program, and it helped us achieve some major team building goals. Uh, we were able to uh, formally document individual liaison areas. Um, and we were also able to allow liaisons to see what each other's work looked like. Um, a little bit of information about the University of Alabama. Alabama is a doctoral research university. We have a sprawling southern campus, but our libraries are actually really close together. There are about five of them, and we work together um, in our work as well as in our proximity. Um, this project was a part of our reorganization of our liaison roles and the redefining of liaison work. Next slide. So when we set our goals, we knew that we needed at least three years. Uh, some of what took us so long was working with our external partners. We also did the bulk of our work during our summers, which freed liaisons to focus on the work of supporting their liaison areas during the academic year. Next slide. Um, our liaisons partnered in and out of the library. So you see a list of all of the partnerships that we had in our project. Uh, this is just a quick overview. I'm going to walk you through each stage very briefly just to describe the partner involvement at the point of impact. Next slide. Um, I have some big picture notes for you. Our project was intended to uh, map the undergraduate curriculum for one year on the department level and um, on the course level. Uh, we had to make some technical decisions and so those are, are documented here. All right, next slide. These are some of the major takeaways that I've come up with when I reflect on our project. Um, Obviously, documentation is important to not only have something to refer back to when people get confused, but also to hold your focus. And I think that documentation is important on the broad picture level, um, on the project level, as well as um, for each step. Uh, contacting external stakeholders should happen early and it should happen often, and you should copy more than one person on any of those emails um, to make transitions smoother. Um, working with external partners can often take a bit of time depending on what you're needing from them. So set plenty of time aside for those negotiations and the building of those relationships. Involve your administrators. I can't tell you how critical our associate deans were in our project, both for um, facilitating campus relationships and also um, helping liaisons stay accountable and keeping everybody on track with deadlines. Um, they were super important for that. Uh, if you are planning on being a project manager for a curriculum mapping project, I encourage you to pace yourself and practice self care and be flexible. And remember that nobody is going to be as excited about this project as you are, but everybody's going to take something away from it. Um, I think Casey alluded to this a little bit as well. Um, some people are more um, thrilled and more uh, will value the, the work a little bit more than others. Next slide. So we had a three stage um, project. Uh, so we started with macro level data collection on every undergraduate program on campus. Um, we didn't collect non academic 
um, data and we didn't track extracurricular programs, but we did include a separate map for distance learning and a separate map for our core curriculum. Um, this stage took a whole year to plan. It started with about four months of negotiating and piloting a template. Um, a few key participants worked really hard to define the categories of data that we needed and that took a lot of negotiating. It was very, it started out very grassroots in that, in that um, regard. People were very excited about it. We had really frequent open meetings attended by most of our liaisons and um, that really helped keep everybody informed so that when they finally um, stepped in to uh, move beyond the pilot and collect the data for the entire curriculum, um, they knew what to do. Next slide. This is a snapshot of one of um, our filled in templates. So uh, you can see the template information is across the top in the headings. The first three columns were populated with data that we got from our course management system. And that was part of our partnership with the registrar's office. So we were able to um, populate all of that through um, gaining access to spreadsheets of courses happening in different programs and departments. Next slide. Um, we converted them um, into uh, a different type of spreadsheet in order to generate this interactive visualization of our program and level um, department level data. During our second summer, um, liaisons at the early summer had a deadline to turn in all of their data collection. And then I um, was able to recruit two interns from the University of Alabama's School of Library and Information Studies. And those two interns were interested in learning about curriculum mapping. So they helped me work on data transformation. Um, and we partnered with the Alabama Digital Humanities Center, which is part of our library, to code this interactive map. Um, the interns used a script written by our digital humanities technologist, Tyler Grace, and Tyler mentored my interns through the process. They were able to clean and transform about 46 data sets. Next slide. So stage two was a syllabi analysis, and we've heard a little bit about this so far in this webinar. Ours was pretty extensive, and this was our biggest partnership with the Office of Institutional Research and Assessment. Um, it took quite a long time to uh, figure out exactly what we were doing with this. Um, and I want to give a really special shout out to the librarians at Pepperdine who graciously spent a ton of time um, walking us through a project that they had done. Um, looking at their work made our project so much easier. Um, we were really curious about what the undergraduate curriculum would show us. Um, we were interested in things like how are instructors describing their courses? What kinds of language are they using to communicate about learning goals in their um, to, to their students? And also, how are they describing research within their courses? So our Office of Institutional Research and Assessment maintains our campus syllabi repository for accreditation. Um, instructors deposit their syllabi and that is mandatory although the minimum detail is not always helpful so these syllabi are available online in a database in html but for our purposes we needed them in excel files so that we could query them using in vivo which is a qualitative analysis tool next slide so we worked with oira to choose headings from the syllabi, and then they scrubbed all of the information that we didn't actually need or require for our project. Um, exploring these options for headings and file types and delivery method is what took the most time in this partnership, um, especially because there were some ebbs and flow in the staffing on both sides of the equation. So our main contact over at OIRA ended up retiring and the work didn't get seamlessly passed to somebody else and then it, it got shifted around a little bit. So um, that's why I recommend um, having lots of people uh, as a contact point at any um, partnership. Um, we set up a shared um, box folder and OIRA structured the entire syllabi 
um, and it was a really compact structure. So they put the entire undergraduate curriculum syllabi for one semester in a worksheet. And then once we received it, we busted them up to mirror the data collection that had happened in stage one. So however the liaison had defined a program or a department curriculum in stage one, we included all of that data for our syllabi analysis in a, a spreadsheet at that point to mirror that. Next slide. So um, here is an example of our reports that we generated, which were um, prepared for each liaison area. It took about two months for us to produce these reports for each liaison. Um, only two of us worked on this step. So only two of us were doing the in vivo coding. Um, we did this for three reasons. Learning in vivo is really complicated and time consuming, and we didn't want liaisons to have to um, have that burden in order to access this information. We also wanted control over the consistency of this step a little bit more. We wanted to be able to produce a really clean um, report for the analysis of the, the syllabi. Um, and producing these finished products for liaisons allowed liaisons to stay in that um, headspace. Okay, so next slide. Um, this stage was our course level mapping, as you can see what our goals were. It took about four months. We did this over our final summer. Um, next slide. And this is uh, just sort of what we're looking forward to. Um, our mapping project is the foundation of our instruction assessment and our goal setting. Um, it sort of sets the liaison culture for us. So um, next slide, if you would like to contact me, I'm welcome, um, I welcome any kind of um, sharing of information. I will share my materials with you. And thank you everyone for listening. Oh, there's a couple, there's my, my course maps. Hello, can you hear us? Can everybody hear us? This is Laura Koo, great. Okay, so uh, let's just go to the next slide, please. So at Ithaca College, we have created curricula maps for three different programs, the School of Business and the following two health sciences programs, speech language pathology and audiology and occupational science. So our process is a little more organic and homegrown and it has evolved over time as we've become better at determining what information we need to conduct an analysis. And at present, this list here is the complete process. So first we request the syllabi for all the required courses in that particular major. Um, and when analyzing the syllabi, we're reviewing the student learning outcomes as described by the faculty, the course objectives and goals, and the required and recommended readings. And finally, the assignments. And over time while doing this process for the three different case studies that we're going to discuss today, we've discovered that including the assignments is imperative to really understanding how to determine when and how to insert research support into the curriculum. And then looking at the syllabi, we, we ask questions. We ask what content is being taught? When is it being taught? How is it being taught? and how does our work align with and support their goals so that we can be most efficient and effective in addressing the course program's overall learning objectives. Uh, so the next step in our process is that we develop a set of research skill-based SLOs for each year based on our reading of the syllabi and the assignments. And then we found it helpful to group these SLOs into broad categories or research foci. And it becomes really obvious when you're doing the analysis, and I'll be getting to that in a couple of slides. Uh, next, we've found it really interesting to map the library research SLOs to another framework, such as the ACRL framework, but it could also be a different framework, such as an external accreditation uh, standard that some disciplines follow very closely. Um, we try to meet with the faculty at least once throughout the process. Um, a couple of times would be even better. Um, just to check in with them and see if what you're creating makes sense. And they may have some ideas on external accrediting bodies that might be interesting to examine during the overall curricular analysis. 
And finally, we found that creating an infographic of our analysis helps to visually communicate our suggested information literacy integration strategy. Okay, so next slide, please. So this is actually a visualization of our origin story. Um, uh, several years back, we um, met with a group of business school faculty. Their concern was that uh, the students entering the capstone courses across the school's majors were not well prepared to uh, succeed in the capstone courses. And we discussed with them um, the opportunity to get all of the syllabi, which we were able to get. At, that, at that, this time in the college's history, syllabi were not required to include student learning outcomes. They now are. So we got all of the syllabi. We began to tease out what we thought were learning outcomes that were related to either library resources uh, or library skills. And we went through and mapped all of this. And Laura has a slide that we'll show you later of our homegrown organic way of doing this. But this is a visualization which indicates, uh, we hope it's a little complicated here, but shows the connections across all of the years of the curriculum and the need to continue to engage. We had the standard practice in the school, which I would call minding the gap. Many of you are probably familiar with that, where we saw a lot of the students in the first year, and then we were doing a lot of remedial work in the fourth year. And so the point in engaging with the business school faculty was to think about when could we reinforce skills um, and how to continue to build and scaffold skills so that students could prepare to complete the major. Next slide. Um, the, all, the, the School of Business has a standard curriculum that all students take regardless of their major. Um, and so there's one year that they all take in year four, but we recognize then in the final year, depending on their major, there's finance, international business management and marketing. There are some specific things that we teach to that are, that are unique to those disciplines. Next slide. So this is the process visualization slide for the speech language pathology and audiology. And so to begin the curricular review, we used a lot of post-it notes. And this represents our analysis of 20 of the required courses in the program. And um, just as an addition, because I do see a question about getting access to the syllabi, it, it was really easy for us. They're actually required to give them at the dean level. So in any case, I was able to get the syllabi um, very easily and the same for the assignments that we were able to get access to. Um, so just for some context, this particular curricular review was inspired by um, my unsuccessful attempts to address and fix the lack of library research instruction provided in this program. So when I started working on this project, I was meeting with the students only once in the program and this was during their fourth year. And I met with most of the students during the spring or last semester of their fourth year, or literally weeks before they graduated from the program. I also collect uh, assessment feedback, qualitative assessment feedback using the one minute paper. And that asks two questions. What, you know, uh, what have you learned that's useful? What questions do you still have? And the question that kept coming up from the students is why haven't we been introduced to this earlier? So um, let's go to the next slide, please. This is our uh, infographic for the speech language pathology and audiology program. It's our sequential model of their department. And this map is divided into four columns to represent the four years of the program. And so as we were working through the post-it notes and the syllabi, we identified three major themes that emerged. So the three themes that we found um, are search strategies, resources, and assessment. And when looking at the infographic, the blue circle represents search strategies, the purple represents resources, and the green represents assessment. So once we started placing the research skills that we created into the themes, we noticed that assessment, the green circle, um, defined as the need to evaluate, analyze, and synthesize information naturally increased over time, while the number of search strategies and resources started to decrease over time. And so we really wanted to try to indicate and illustrate that we wanted earlier integration of information literacy skills, that we didn't want it to be redundant, which is frustrating to the students. And we certainly didn't want to wait until the last semester to introduce the information literacy skills. And I, I would say um, Laura and I had the opportunity to present this 
um, one departmental model to the entire School of Health Science and Human Performances, which caused a lot of people to say, we want this for our department. So having an effective visual um, illustration of a process, I think, is a great way um, to engage people who haven't yet engaged with us in this work. Next slide, please. So this is a visualization of the process that I use for occupational science. Um, and it's very much the same where I took notes and marked up all of the required course syllabi and I generated SLOs for each year, which I then added to a spreadsheet. And just for some context for this particular program, the faculty came to us probably because we had presented the speech language pathology poster to their departmental meeting. And they came to us as they were undergoing some major changes in their curriculum based on their external accredit accrediting um, organization as they were changing their standards. So they wanted us to, to take a look at their syllabus and to try to come up with an assessment for them. Um, so this is a screenshot of just two sections of different spreadsheets that represent year one where you can see in the top screenshot that there are 15 SLOs that we created based on reading the syllabi and the assignments for the first year. And then there's a section for the ACRL threshold concepts and knowledge practices. And when we did this, the ACRL framework had really just been published. It was recently published, so we thought we would look at that to try to get a better understanding of how we could use that to guide our instruction. Um, and the knowledge practices, which I'm sure many of you know, are sort of skills that learners can develop as they move through the threshold concepts. And they're listed as bullet points on the framework, but I numbered them so I could keep better track of what skills were being represented and when. And then I use the same broad categories that I use in the speech program that include search strategies, resources, and assessment. And again, that seemed very obvious and it emerged when looking at the SLOs that we created. The smaller screenshot is a summary of which and how many threshold concepts were included in the first year, and also the occurrence of the broad themes in the first year. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is the infographic that we created for the speech lane, uh, sorry, for the OS uh, program, occupational science. So each circle represents one of the four years of the program. In the middle of the large, in the middle of the large circles, um, the number indicates the number of library created SLOs that we made. The colorful circles represent the threshold concepts and the small gray circles resting on the bottom right of each circle represents the broad research themes. Uh, so in total, there were 39 SLOs that we created um, and were categorized into at least one of the following three themes, the search strategy, resource, and assessment. Um, search strategy, development, and resource, um, sorry, uh, resource knowledge emerged as a foci for the, for, uh, for the first year and then just started to decrease over time. Uh, critical assessment of information emerged during the fourth year, so this is very similar to the speech program. Uh, searching and strategic exploration was the most common threshold concept during the first and second years. During the third year, research as inquiry uh, was the most common threshold concept. And during the fourth year, information has value occurred more than any of the other threshold concepts. So uh, in sum, creating a curriculum map based on the analysis of the syllabi, assignments, and readings informed and helped to identify research skills that support a particular program. And the infographic is a really helpful way to illustrate the patterns and the results of the analysis, especially for very complex relationships. I would also say that framing um, the, the infographic to um, the discipline or to the department, um, it, while some of it is generic from our point of view to them, it's very pointed and is, it's all about them <laughs> and how we can help them to achieve their curricular student learning outcomes. So it's been a successful approach for us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We're back to me. This is Marinda. Can you all hear me all right? Just make sure that my great. Okay, thanks. Okay, so first, um, we have about five minutes left for questions. I'd like to take a moment before we do that, though, to profusely thank our panelists for being here today. This is a virtual hand clap 
for all of you. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. And I also would like to share my sincere thanks with Sheila Stockel as the chair of the 2018 Conference Planning Committee. You know, these things happen, uh, these events get planned over a period of months and it takes a lot of time to bring everybody together. And I thank Sheila and her team, Nicole Hellregel, Michael Ray Pierce, Anna Mary Williford, and Megan Griffin at ACRL um, for bringing us a great presentation and a lot of things to think about today. So let, I pulled together a few questions here um, from the chat box. So I will just go through them real quickly. Um, back to um, Laura and Lizbeth, Dolores had a two part question. It looks like everyone is looking at major classes rather than general core classes. Is that correct? And yeah, then the second were, part yes. sorry, is what do you, sorry, the second part is what do you do with the classes that don't have a library component? So yes, you're right. We were looking at the required courses for the for each major. We weren't looking at any of the general electives. So really specific to that discipline. And so I guess the idea being that using looking at all of the syllabi for that particular major was a way to help us identify where library instruction should be inserted um, and where it shouldn't be so as to not again uh, duplicate content which can be very frustrating for our students so that we could um, manage it better yeah and, and by looking at the required courses we're somewhat guaranteed that we're going to see all students in the major Otherwise, there's a, a concern that we will only see, uh, you know, particularly faculty and who's teaching one section of a course that, that, that has been engaged with the library. So by focusing on required courses, I think we got more faculty buy-in. Um, this is Sarah. Uh, I'm at Alabama. We um, did map our core curriculum and one of our major purposes with our program was um, that we are looking at W courses, which is one of the core designations. And students can take a W outside of their major. So we're really focusing on that. We also identified courses that have research in them, but are not, not designated as the core W. So that was our metric for like opportunity, not necessarily whether it was a major course or required in a major. Anyone else wanna chime in? Okay. okay. Um, sorry, did sorry, I speak on someone? Make sure you turn your audio to mute when you're done. Great. So there's no feedback. Okay. Um, let's see. We had another question here. One of the things that I think um, everyone recognizes is that um, we should bring community colleges into these discussions that we don't often enough. And my goal as chair has been to do that. Um, we have a question here. We don't have majors to map to at community colleges, but we do have guaranteed transfer courses of specific degree requirements for associate or of science or associate of arts degrees, for example. Do you have any advice on where to start with this type of curriculum? Great question. I think, uh, this is Laura, I think it's really helpful to have the syllabi, um, if you can get access to those along with the um, assignments. And by doing that, it's helpful, it will help you to identify where to, when and where to meet with the students and how and what you should be teaching. Yeah, this is Casey. I, I think getting the flow of whatever they are doing is sort of the goal. So yeah, I think the syllabi is a good place to start and trying to track the flow and possible generate um, accumulation of outcomes across that flow could be helpful no matter the class, so. Okay, another question for Lizbeth. How do you define the research foci search resources assessment part of what you were discussing? Don't oh, okay. okay, oh, so the three broad categories. Well, so when we were looking at the SLOs, um, it was very uh, discreet in the sense that the SLO would define, for example, um, you know, introduce, you know, develop a thesis statement or evaluate a website. And in some cases, one, some of these SLOs, it was clear that 
they needed to have some level of assessment and, or that they needed to know about a particular resource. Um, and then in some instances, it was searching for information. And those three seem to be the ones that emerged. So it was fairly you know, broad and search means having to search for information. Um, resource indicates that it's a resource like PubMed or CINAHL or a book that's important. Um, and then the assessment was how to synthesize and um, evaluate information. Right. But we, we found in, in one of the goals, I think, in doing what we were doing was to, to identify resources to which we subscribe generally that we thought students should be introduced to in order to develop a particular skill. Um, and it, it's primarily databases, um, and, and they would say, oh yes, we do want them to know CINAHL, we do know, want them to know copy reviews, we want them to be able to, so some of it was, that's why you see in our one model that there are, there's less of introducing resources as you go through the curriculum, and there's more of the students actually using them, doing search strategies, and then doing assessment. And I would also like to add that um, there was a sort of an unexpected outcome, which um, was that we were able to determine gaps in our collection by looking at the required and recommended reading lists. So that was actually helping to inform the resource category as well. And we did give the faculty a list of resources attached, you know, um, in relation to each year as a result of the SLOs. And the faculty were really help, help, uh, happy with that because it helped them with their accreditation. Um, and for me, it was just helpful to know, oh golly, we need to order these books, or we need these resources, or we have these, we should use them. Mm -hmm. And I would say for um, another ad added benefit a bit was that um, we were able also at times to say, oh, well, we can create a library guide, or we can create a tutorial to accompany this skill, and they would go, that's wonderful. So it has led to uh, more requests and more interaction with faculty as well. Great. Um, we are at the end of our time together today. Um, I would like to thank all of you for being here. If you have further questions, please do reach out to our panelists. I'm sure they would all be more than happy to talk with you individually. We will be archiving the PowerPoints, all the links, and the recording on the IS website. And then the last thing I have for you is uh, a question for you as an IS member, which is, how can we support you in your work in curriculum mapping as the instruction section re-envisions itself as we think about our committee structure and how we interact with our members what are the best ways for us to help you do your work because that's why we're here so if you have ideas please do fill out the feedback form that's linked on the front of the is webpage feel free to reach out to me or any member of exec at any time. We're more than happy to um, take your suggestions and also just have conversations about what this looks like. I have, um, I think IS has been traditional in a lot of ways for a long time and it's time to break outside of that tradition and to try new things. So please help us do that with your ideas and your enthusiasm. So thanks very much for being here. Thank you panelists. Thank you Sheila and your team. This was really great. And um, I will be signing off as IS chair officially at the beginning of July and passing the gavel over to Megan Sitar. She's at the University of Michigan. We're all in good hands. And thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Miranda and uh, Sheila and everyone, if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. This is Laura. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Appreciate it very much. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.